Hi, welcome to the Sensible Project Manager Hangout uh, uh, number 16. We are um, rolling right along. Uh, today's topic is techniques for continuous improvement. Uh, this is a topic that came up with, is actually suggested by Ellen Daly, and, and uh, he's He's on, on the Hangout with me today. We should be joined by uh, at least one other. Hala probably should join us a little bit later. Um, must have been hung up a little bit. Um, anyway, the topic is going to be a very fun one. Before we get going, because I know that the PM chat is out there, uh, they're ramping up and, and uh, starting to introduce each other um, and tell everybody who's, who's, who's home and who's uh, on, the, on the chat. Uh, just wanted to, to bring up a little thing at the very beginning here. We uh, Next week, a little thing I'm trying to get going is uh, next week is networking, uh, a project manager and networking days. Uh, it coincides with the um, PMI Global Congress. During that same time that the Congress is, ha is happening, uh, just I want to encourage everybody to, to network together. Uh, and that's as simple as I don't. If you want to just to get together with the PM buddy that uh, to you and you two go out to uh, coffee, that's that's what I'm talking about. That if you want to set up a, a hangout like we we are in the sensible sensible PM hangout community. I can't even say that today. Uh, I'm I'd love to be able to give the challenge to the community themselves. To I'd like to be able to see if we can get uh, nine to ten hangouts um, hang uh, happening sometime during the the <clears throat> during the October 26th to the 29th. Um, so if any of you in the community feel like you can uh, take on a role of of uh, starting a uh, an event a hangout, pick a time where another one is not being held. And just put out the invite to individuals, see if we can get people to sign up and hang out. Uh, again, the whole purpose is just to, to promote the idea of uh, pro professional networking. And uh, the only thing I would ask is as you set those up, whether it's in the community or any other where, um, just go to uh, www.projectmanagernetworking.com and on that site, I have listed out or have a way for you to list your event and I, it will just be interesting to see how many events we can have worldwide. Uh, anyway, so that's that's my little announcement, my little plug for uh, getting everybody to network. Uh, probably mention it one time next week uh, in the next hangout, but uh, just wanted to get everybody thinking about that. It's easy to set it something up. So uh, again, I want to welcome Alan. Let's uh, Let's get to you. Why don't you introduce yourself? You've been here before, so but uh, why don't you introduce yourself again? Hi. Um, yeah, my name is Alan Daly. I'm an uh, uh, Agile coach on staff with a consulting company called Big Visible Solutions. Help companies uh, get their teams going with Agile, help the organization change to accommodate Agile. And, of course, most of the Agile frameworks have a lot to do with project management. So... Uh, it's kind of a natural fit to these discussions. Um, I'm excited to be uh, on this topic. Uh, I'm flattered that uh, my suggestion is engaged, and I'm really happy that I was able to join. So. Great. Hall, welcome. You are, it sounds like you have a little bit of echo there. Yeah. My name is Alan Daly. I'm, um, oh, <laughs> you might want to take, turn the hangout off. <laughs> help companies uh, get their teams going with Agile, help their well, so she's here in both. Um, so, Alan, just curious about you. Uh, what was it that, uh, before we, as we get started, what was it that you uh, caused you to think about this topic? Just give me some thoughts about that, and then we'll get to, uh, to Hala. Well, so continuous improvement is a, is a, it tends to be a buzzword. You know, you ask somebody, do you do continuous improvement? And what are they going to say? Yes. They're going to say yes. Of course they're going to say yes because um, it sounds so good and it is so good and all that stuff. Um, but the reality is so very few, very few companies, very few teams, and then very few individuals actually create structures um, or ways that they can naturally actually do continuous improvement. Um, 
so it, it's not that continuous improvement is super hard, it's that it's hard to have the discipline to actually apply it and do it. Um, so I think it's a very interesting topic because most of us want to do it or say we do it, and the reality is most of us have a hard time with it. Um, so well, kind of well, you have just um, identified me as your profile. Because, <laughs> because I, I, I have, uh, I understand some concepts about uh, um, continuous improvement. I would like to think that I do that. Um, I have been in organizations where we have done, um, uh, we were very diligent in setting up processes and procedures to, to methodologies to do process improvement. But it has not been a large part of my career. As far as, I, you know, I'm always looking for better ways to make my projects work in, in, in different ways. But it's that whole concept of really making a concerted effort to apply that for those process improvements, um, continuous improvements, into the business. That is, I agree, that's an important thing. And it doesn't, it's done very rarely, I think. Yeah. Yep, I agree. Hola, welcome. Hello. I am late to the party. <laughs> that's all right. These hangouts, that's why they call them hangouts, is because we're just hanging out. And you know me and Google Hangout, how much of a great relationship we have. Um, I continue to have technical, <laughs> technical <laughs> challenges with it, but I'm figuring it out. I'm improving every time. <laughs> Well, Hala, thank you for joining us. Tell us again a little bit about yourself. I know you've been on here a couple of times, but let's go ahead and introduce yourself again. Sure. Um, so I am a project uh, manager by training, I guess you would say. So I um, started out as a developer, went into project management a few years ago, did that for a while, and um, uh, became went into kind of the agile world and agile coaching and now I'm actually doing more product management so on the product side of things um, but I'm still very passionate about um, project management and about um, you know uh, furthering the the industry and the profession and uh, really helping people uh, reach their maximum potential with it as a as a career um, path great and you're you are uh, playing dual role today. Are you also yes. keeping the chat going, or is that Robert doing that? Yes, I am. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I believe it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so I will be uh, wearing two hats, and I will try not to look too much like I'm watching a tennis game. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be yeah, typing and, and trying to talk at the same time. Um, I might have to drop... Uh, for a bit and then maybe join again so just to give you a heads up that this is a great topic and I think a lot of the community uh, looks forward to getting started with the, the discussion. Great well just as a matter of the two hats it's a, it is a step down from the six hats we wore last week. Yes. <laughs> okay so let's uh, let's let's get going with the the topic. Um, as I mentioned I have uh, done Continuous improvement, more I, I guess more on the accidental point of view. Uh, let's start with just a definition of what continuous improvement really means. Um, so, just in, in general, the definition that I saw is an ongoing effort to improve products, services, and processes. Um, that I've I've been out to several. Uh, resources and all of them use that same type of terminology um, there's I know that there's a lot more to that so um, Alan do you have any more that you wanted to add to kind of a definition point of view well it's it's fascinating to me that 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 definition while it's good um, and that tends to be the areas that we're going to, that people focus for process or for improvement right either the product services or processes. Um, but it's interesting to me that it doesn't say improve people, um, which to me is the biggest, hardest, and most important place to improve. So uh, I would add um, 
and people or and teams or whatever, something that involves people to that definition. Oh, perfect. I, I mean, that sounds like a reasonable thing to add to that. Um, Holly, do you have anything, to, any thoughts to, and, and, and your experience with that, the, the, just the concept of um, continuous improvement? Um, so Alan touched on a really great point. For me, it's um, more continuous improvement from a team perspective is really what my focus has been. Just by nature of, I guess, the project and the and the um, the environment that I'm in, that's really more relevant than continuous improvement at this phase of processes per se. Um, I have been involved in um, in in projects and in companies where continuous improvement of the process has been the main focus. Uh, but for me now, what's really relevant is you know, continuously uh, looking at how we work together as a team, improving that, um, how, what's the team dynamic, what's the environment, the cultural um, environment that leads to better output and, and more productive people, happier people, uh, and better work. So that, to me, that's really what's most relevant right now. Okay. Uh, just, just curious. Just maybe even stepping back a little bit. So the definition we've we kind of co we covered that a little bit. But where's the history of continuous improvement really reach back to? Um, if I remember, I, I'm I'm a uh, a child of the uh, grew up high school years in the 70s. That dates me a little bit. Um, but I I remember that. The, the whole advent of the Japanese comp companies, especially the Japanese cars, coming to the United States and, and just the, the level of quality that was coming out. If I understand um, the concepts of, of uh, continuous improvement and that whole methodology as it came out, um, <clears throat> really starting with Deming, I think, um, and those, those concepts there, and the implementations that the Japanese did, um, that really, to me, seems like that's the, the beginnings of the concepts that are an underlying or the in underpinnings of, of continuous improvement. Thoughts on that? I, I, I haven't really ever studied the, the history of continuous improvement as a, you know, specifically continuous improvement as a topic. Um, it, it makes sense to me that a lot of it pr probably came from the manufacturing world, probably came from people like W. Edwards Deming. Deming. Um, uh, I, I was a kid when all the Toyota and Honda cars started invading the U.S. And, uh, and, and going back and reading about that is, you know, they, they did things like U.S. manufacturers at the time would think that a yield, a factory run yield was a, a, a defect rate of 10% was acceptable, and the Japanese were going for a defect rate of, uh, you know, 0.1% or 0.01%, um, and it made a huge difference. Um, and in order to get to that higher quality, you do have to have a way of constantly adjusting and changing your processes uh, to get better and better. Um, so I, I, I don't know if that's really the history of it. Um, but we have those wonderful words like Kaizen and some of these other concepts that came from uh, Japan and the Orient um, where they embraced kind of these high quality movements sooner than American manufacturing did. Yeah, right. so um, we have a lot of responses in the Twitter chat uh, discussing uh -huh. that um, in, in terms of continuous uh, improvement. People's defining people are defining it as staying vigilant for opportunities to fine tune processes, then gently inserting into existing systems. That's Michael Greer, and I like his take on it. Um, you know, there's a there, you can be very systematic and very dedicated to doing continuous improvement a certain way, but um, uh, I, I enjoy the, the kind of being more thoughtful about it. Um, other people are saying that it's a process for exploring, experimenting, and adopting what works best with a disciplined approach. This is Anku. And then Katie Morgan um, is saying that she, you know it's a feedback loop involving deployment, implementation, assessment, design of improvements, and then looping back. Um, really, if you go back, going back to the history of it, it was 
um, it, this does come from the Toyota produ production system, uh, which really started after World War II, and, and they wanted to really standardize the way that they their, their business process in order to reduce, um, you know, abnormalities or, or issues um, coming into the process. And so um, the, there are five, five and so in, in Japanese, I guess, Kaizen means improvement, and then based on its adoption within the Toyota production system and uh, um, and how it, it became more formalized, it, it came to mean continue the process of continuous improvement. Um, and there are five main elements, which are uh, teamwork, uh, discipline, morale, um, I think quality, uh, and suggestions, continuous suggestions for improvement. And so you can kind of take each one of those and figure out how do you how do you take each one of those elements and build them into your culture, into your working culture. Um, and and there's you know there's that whole cycle of standardizing the, an operation or a way something is done, measuring it, um, gauging those measurements against what requirements we had, and then innovating. Actually, there is a. a, a Part of this does involve innovation um, to to see if we can in increase productivity based on what we found, um, and then standardizing that new improved process, and then you continue that cycle. Um, so just to to give a little bit of background from what I know um, on kaizen and continuous improvement. Thank you. That's uh, I, as I said, I've I've done some study on it, but uh, I, I I just remember <clears throat> as, as as I said, just just the the quality of the uh, of the of the autos that were coming out of the, of the Japanese, and that that whole that started a whole movement um, that certainly we're we're working on today. Um, and where, Hall, where did you where did you get the resources there that you just quoted? Because I hadn't seen those details. Um, I've been so there's a lot in the Lean community. About um, kaizen and continuous improvement, it is um, it is you know very central to to lean philosophies, and I've been uh, studying and trying to learn more about lean um, and combine that with what I know. So um, that I've I've studied it myself, just as in terms of trying to get to be more familiar. And then um, there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, there's a lean uh, change. Institute, I think, is what it's called, and I get a lot of um, information and, and resources from there. So that's a really good that's a really good place to go. You can go and just Google them, and then um, sign up, and they send a weekly, uh, or even more than once a week, they send a newsletter and information and updates. Um, and so I've I've just been reading up on it through there and and other resources. But I can do a more formal um, search for some of the resources that I've been using and actually create a list and maybe share them with the community. That would be great. Yeah, and then also if anybody in the, uh, the community has, in the PM chat, has uh, some any of that information, it would be great to share. Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the next thing I was thinking about doing is, is that it, I think it would be interested to to talk about um, what are those components that makes um, continuous improvement successful. You know, I, I want to get to the actual um, specific techniques a little bit later on, but I'm interested in <clears throat> in discussing what 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 does it what does it mean to be successful in a continuous improvement um, process? <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm having a tough time with my voice. Um, so thoughts on that? Well, what, is, what does it mean to be successful? I think that's a very contextual um, you know, question. Uh, the success for one person is not going to be the successful enough or success for another person. So um, I, I, I would kind of reframe it a little bit maybe. Um, if you wanted to try and gauge success kind of in a more generic way, you might want to ask uh, ask yourself a question, and that is, um, if it's true that that um, as an individual, as a team, or as an organization, if it's true that we're actually doing continuous improvement, then uh, name something we improved yesterday, or name something we improved last week. Right? What what did we improve or change 
in the recent past that shows where are we are doing continuous improvement. Um, and the few times that I've actually been in a relationship such that I could ask such a blatant question of somebody, um, many times people can't name what they improved. That doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't improving, but it seems to me that if continuous improvement is part of what you do and part of your culture, you should be able to cite what you changed, what you improved in the recent past within the last week or two. What did you change and improve that you're doing different today that you weren't doing before? Right. Um, and if you're not able to cite anything, then maybe that's a, that's an indicator that says, well, we didn't change anything except for six months ago. We changed a little something or whatever. Then that may be an indicator to you that, hey, perhaps continuous improvement uh, is not something we're focusing on and something we should get back to. Um, I, would, I would add to that, too, um, not just measuring after the fact of what did we improve this time around, but also just saying beforehand, setting maybe one goal to improve, uh, you know, per, let's say, if you're working on iterations or per time period, and let's say, so just to make it easy, what we try to do is we incorporate sometimes, okay, uh, so I do, we do our retrospectives and we have all of our, <laughs> all of our post-its from the retrospectives, and, the, and that's one of our main feedback loops for our continuous improvement efforts. Um, so from our retrospectives, we always have the, uh, a column that may be, may be phrased a different way, but basically it, it, it is what do, we, what do we do about it? So we've identified issues, we've identified things that we went really well, but what are we going to do about it? And that's where those things, maybe we have you know, a handful of post-its or whatever items that were listed, and we t tend to group them together, so we do affinity grouping to make it such that there are more like categories. And uh, we, sorry about that, and we um, take one per every time and, and put it into our goal for that upcoming sprint or upcoming two week period or one week period in this case. And we say, okay, so this time around, let's try. And I always keep my, um, keep what are my notes from our last retrospective so that we can take a look at them again um, the next time uh, we start one and say, hey, you know, are we actually taking any of these off? Um, did we actually improve in that area? Well, I guess, <clears throat> so I, I hear both of you saying um, that we're talking about generalities of, of, of all right, what did we improve? Um, Holly, you're talking about, uh, on, I'm assuming that this is in, in a scrum sprints that you're, you're kind of, you're watching as you do improvements through re retrospectives. Um, I know that, it, in Six Sigma, for instance, it's a very specific measurement of defects per million. Um, it, is it always that type of um, measurements, or can you put more solid measurements to say that I am successful? Or, or, or is it always require those kinds of measurements like in Six Sigma? I think the framework makes a really big difference, Mark. So, um, for example, a lot of the way that we've been working within, if you talk to people within the Agile community, um, a lot of the way that people have been working moving forward has been um, to try and uh, even say, go go as far as say we don't we're never going to release anything that has bugs, meaning. You don't wait until you release something to find out that it has bugs. The way that you're working should mean that issues are through, whether it's through pair programming or, you know, unit testing and, and uh, you know, test-driven development or whatever it is that you're doing, trying to, and making sure that people are dedicated to one thing at a time versus trying to have them multitask, um, seeing if we, we can really get to that point where things are just getting fixed and released, fixed and re developed and fixed and released, developed and fixed and released. And um, that in that context, for us, we haven't really found that metric of bugs per lines of code or whatever it is uh, to be a useful one to track. It's been more of um, how many, for example, how many times have we 
released anything that we then had to retract or that we um, had issues with in, in production or a critical, a crash, maybe that how many times did we have something that cra caused something to crash. So I think it just changes, those metrics change, but as long as you have something that's relevant both to your environment and to the type of work that you're doing and to your team that actually, that actually means something to them. So defects for lines of code never meant anything really to my developers. Like they never latched onto it as something that was meaningful. Find something that's meaningful and track it. Okay. So Alan, I, I, going back to one of the things that you said um, earlier at, at the very beginning was um, quite often we find ourselves saying that we do process improvement, but um, but we really don't have those things in places in the organization or in our projects which um, are, are there to specifically do process improvement. And to me, part of that, that continuous improvement has to be some way of measuring. I agree with you, Hala, that um, that is going to be different for each time. But is it always require the, some kind of measurement or matrix that you have to, to uh, metrics you have to, to measure? Or can you have, if you're not measuring um, your continuous improvement, are you falling into that realm that, Alan, you're saying earlier that you're just saying you're doing process improvement? Well, you, yes and no. Um, if, if you are spe specifically defining, say, in a retrospective, a team retrospective that Hala brought up is a great, very visible example of a place where you can have a specific structure for creating improvements. Um, you do a retrospective every sprint or every iteration, or if you're not doing sprints and iterations, uh, you know, once a month or whatever it is, and you're talking about things that need to be improved. And if you're picking specific actions that you're going to take to create that improvement, um, that action, uh, you can then track, did somebody take that action? What was the result of that action? Maybe that action does involve some kind of metric, and that's fine. Um, but at least that way you have a way of tracking and seeing the improvement happen. So that's a great example of a structure that helps an improvement ha happen. Um, metrics are a dangerous thing in that pr the metric can become the point instead of the reason you're having the metric. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so I like to use, and I don't know where this comes from, a fellow coach of, of mine uh, brought it up and, and taught me about it, and, and it's, a, it's, it's called G, it's called... Um, GQM, in other words, what, what is our goal? What goal, the G is the goal. What goal do we want? Our goal is fewer bugs or our goal is higher customer satisfaction, whatever that goal is. Then we say, okay, what question can we ask that tells us whether or not that we want to find an answer to the question that will tell us whether or not we've reached the goal. So we're gonna come up with a question uh, that says, for example, um, how many bugs have we had this week compared to last week? Um, we're going to create some kind of question, and then that question, we gonna, we're going to create a metric that helps us answer the question. So uh, most people just jump straight to a metric, say, well, let's measure something. Well, wait, let's find out what is our goal. This improvement is our goal. What question are we asking that will tell us when we've reached the goal, and what metric will answer that question? Um, and this is a good system or a good way to think about metrics so that you're not creating metrics that have little value and they actually specifically answer the question that you're after. Plus, it means that once you have the question answered, maybe you don't need to track the metric anymore. I don't know how many times I've seen status reports on projects or whatever that are so full of metrics that nobody ever reads because <laughs> once you establish a metric, they never go away. Um, so if we use this this uh, GQM kind of structure, it allows us to know the best metric to pick and it helps us decide when to stop tracking that metric. So uh, that's one of the structures or ways that we can uh, measure our improvement. Um, I also am a big fan though of, of, of the sayings and I don't know who it is that said them, um, but there's a saying that says, uh, not everything that can be measured is valuable and not everything that's valuable can be measured. And I'm, I'm a strong believer in that. So uh, find a metric if it's useful to you, yes. Create, if, track a metric, that's great. But there are also things that don't really have metrics, but you can still strive for them and do them. 
Yeah, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that because I have um, struggled with that. I, I like your approach, the approach you're suggesting, because, for instance, uh, the, the, the whole defects, the number of bugs in a software program, it, it becomes, I, I have always seen that it becomes a battle between the QA team and the development team. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the QA team doesn't want to, they want to find as many bugs as you can. And then the defel- developers, they take offense to um, being having their code um, identified as buggy because right. they don't think that they code anything bad. Uh, it and it just becomes a terrible metrics and and it just becomes a terrible cycle. So I like the approach of of asking the question: What is it? What was it? Is that the goal? Is that we were asking? You're yeah. saying? Yeah. So it's goal. What is our goal? What question will tell us when we've completed that goal? And what metric will give us the answer to the question? Great. Well, I shared your framework on the Twitter chat as well, Alan, and I think. Uh-huh. It's- uh, it's a great one for people to to adopt, and um, so thank you for sharing that, and and I've uh, provided it for the community. Some really great um, answers that we got on how do you gauge um, how do you gauge your success with continuous improvement. Michael Greer said you don't have continuous failures and continuous frustrations and continuous team member burnouts. So that's a it's a good answer. It's kind of uh, self evident when things are improving, everyone's happier. I, um, I I saw that you had mentioned that you were asking that to be put to music. Is Hala? Is that what you? <laughs> yeah, I, did I, maybe you were reading my mind. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you said sing that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, and uh, people really agreed with your point, Alan. Um, on Great. the metric can become the point rather than the reason for the metric. Um, and uh, you know Charles Smith is is also very very supportive of having the metric be under your own control and be flexible. Um, there is so much danger, like you said, of setting up certain metrics that uh, that put two teams you know head to head. So um, one of the the great examples that I've heard a, a few stories about is um, just uh, you know. Scrum masters or people who are even in project managers who are even in an environment that try to up the score for how many story points or whatever your measure is that are getting done per each iteration, um, and so people start to strive towards you know getting in a certain amount of time uh, this percentage of work done or this many points or whatever, and the goal becomes to to improve that number and to and then it just goes into a cycle of inflated you know inflated um, uh, estimates and we got more done than we actually did and it's and it's not productive at all. Um, so you're just chasing those numbers versus actually providing value. Yep. Right. Um, let's let's move into discussing more specific techniques. Um, there is there was in my research there was a, a lot of them. Um, many of them I were I, I was familiar with from just a a general point of view. Um, some of them I have a little bit more um, experience with. But uh, let me just let's let me just throw out that let's start with what is our favorite techniques or, or methodologies that that are used out there uh, that you might have experience with. Um, so Hala well, Allen. Well, then let me go a little bit general before we dive specific, if I may. Okay, that'd be fine. Um, one of the biggest ways to kill a continuous improvement effort or improvement efforts at all, improvement means learning, right? Learning takes time. So if you are working hard to have your people 100% utilized on doing whatever the work is, they don't have time to learn and they don't have time to improve. So one of the key things that you, the organization needs to look at is if you're an organization who wants improvements and things to change and get better, people have to have enough time to be able to do that. And so you, this notion of working hard to find things for people to do and keep them 100% utilized is dangerous to any sort of improvement um, effort. So my first technique, if it can be specific, is Make sure when you're planning your work and figuring out who's doing what and when and how much, there needs to be some extra time in there that 
people have available hours during the week and during the sprint or iteration or whatever that that will get used up in learning. Um, and so that's that's key. <clears throat> that's such a great point. Um, that's such a great point. Oh, I saw this great image in a presentation recently about trying to reach 100% utilization for a team and how um, a lot of organizations kind of uh, try to figure out how much time are you actually working versus time that you're not working and how that um, that basically the, the visual for that was there was a, a very complex system of, uh, of roads and highways and it was kind of all these loops and the, the streets coming down and basically 100% utilization meant that all of the those roads were all jammed with cars 100% so nobody was moving and nobody was making progress um, because you can get to that point where if you're 100% utilized it's not such a great thing nothing is moving or making progress. Um, so that was a great visual that I saw. So just to, to iterate, reiterate your point. Yep. Well, so, uh, to go along with that, I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead, ahead Alan. Oh, no, go, go ahead, ahead Mark. Okay, so the, one of the things that I was thinking that kind of go along with that is not only do you have to have time, but you have to have people trained. People have to understand what... Um, what it means to do the, pro, uh, the uh, continuous improvement. They've got to be able to have the education that's necessary to understand the methodologies that the organization is using. Just my thought. Yep. <laughs> so um, now to get to specific practices, um, retrospectives are super powerful. Um, team retrospectives, personal retrospectives, organizational or project retrospectives, uh, I'm a huge fan of those. Uh, I often tell people in my classes that, uh, you know, if you can only do one thing from Agile, do retrospectives because uh, conceptually all the rest of it will come because you've changed things and you've altered your processes and improved th through what you've learned by doing retrospectives. So I, I think that's one of the most powerful tools for continuous improvement. Um, the idea being that you're not doing postmortems at the very end and putting all your learning of postmortems, they go in some book somewhere that is supposedly studied and read before the next project starts, and it never is. It just becomes a place where you know learnings go to die. Uh, instead, we want to do retrospectives where we pick an action and make improvements, and and continually grab another action and make another improvement. So. That's my big thing. Whether you're doing agile or not, do retrospectives. So just just uh, to tie into that, um, I have I, I've been involved in retrospectives, uh, you know, from Scrum um, point of view. You mentioned not just for your projects, but also organizational, um, and you, I think you talked about teams and people. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, personal. Uh -huh. So how do you go about doing that from a practical point of view? I completely get it from a um, a project you know that is running being run as an agile project at the end of each sprint. How do you do that from a practical point of view for the organization and for the teams and so forth? Well, there there are different techniques. Um, you can go look for um, one of the books. Um, there's a book called Game Storming. I can't remember the author. And there's a book called um, Innovation Games, um, and I'm not remembering the author again. Um, there's also Agile Retrospectives, Making Good Teams Great, which is a great book uh, on the team level. I'm a big fan of that book. So a, a good facilitator can help uh, people uh, go through a series of sequence of steps or exercises that helps to pull in lots of information and then begin to narrow it down into specific actions. Um, so like at a very large project or organizational level, um, you might have 40 or 50 people, key people invited from different places. Um, you might create a theme and um, you can mix some game storming or innovation games techniques to do brainstorming and different other uh, data gathering and insight generation. Um, and then begin to narrow it down to two or three or maybe at most four things that different parts of the organization can take on as things to improve. Um, so, so there are techniques to do that if you have a good facilitator that knows how to handle it. Um, from a personal level, a personal level uh, takes a lot of courage. 
um, I'm, you know, I've done it a few times and it's still scary, uh, but you invite maybe as many as six of people you trust, people that you trust to tell you the truth. And then you, it's almost like a, a 360 degree, you know, review, only you're doing it in person and, and I am the subject and I want these people to tell me things that I do well, things that I don't do so well, and help me choose things that I can do to improve myself. Um, that's something that, that, again, a facilitator can help do, but it takes a high level of trust between the participants, especially the person who's being focused on. Um, I've been in one session with some fellow coaches once where we actually took turns being the focus. So it was kind of like this joint retrospective of, of each of us as a person and figuring out things that we can improve. Um, this is very powerful on a personal level for your own career and your own actions. Great. Thanks. Um, Hala, uh, comments in the PM chat that you're seeing? I see a lot yeah. of it is following right along. Yeah, so um, a, a lot of it is, uh, you know, around the same themes of uh, sitting with your stakeholders to review lessons learned, um, actually just asking the question, um, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Pavel said, you know, just ask, hey team, what could we have done better uh, and what could we do better next time? Um, and, you know, the, uh, Katie is saying that they just started doing a post-project team lunch uh, type of outing to chat about lessons learned, and that informal atmosphere really lent, it, lent itself well to some great conversations. Um, another great idea was to review the issue log. Um, what will you do differently next time to prevent that those issues on the issue log um, don't occur uh, again? So postmortems, you know, a lot of the, the those kind of um, lessons learned uh, in the same theme of retrospectives, I think. Um, and then one of the the way some of the ways that people are saying to make this more approachable uh, with the team are, you know, you need to communicate to the team. Um, this is Tonya saying, stressing to the team that lessons learned are to help us improve, not a performance tool which encourages honest uh, feedback and sharing without fear. And, and I think that is, um, <clears throat> that's really important to stress. If obviously the objective is to do something more of a personal um, review or retrospective, like you were saying, Alan, then that's, that's a little bit different. But when we're talking about the team and getting um, stuff on the team level, I think that's really important. Um, really, one of the big things I wanted to stress about, how do you, how do you facilitate something like that? Um, it, it's really about getting to a point where, where people are comfortable sharing. So making everyone feel like it's a safe environment. Um, if that means that some you know, executives or managers who may be threatening to people um, are not in that meeting, and maybe they, you can have a retrospective with them <laughs> off on the side, and then and then bring them in when they're ready to be a little bit less threatening. Um, you know, having them not be included in those type of meetings so that people will open up and really being very in tune. I think some of what we do as project managers and you know agile coaches or whatever you whatever your role is that where we're we're working with a team of people, a lot of it has to do with intuition and being really really sensitive to understanding people people's motivations and what um, what gets people going and what do, hurts people um, in terms of a, a lot, you know stands in the way of their making progress so if you see that some people are really sensitive and they might not say it but they're sensitive to someone's presence or to certain things when those are said then you try to create an environment where that's not happening as much um, so that you can have them participate um, you know, and, and I w my initial response internally to when you said, how do you, how do, you do those kind of um, reflections or retrospectives, and I was just, um, my, my gut reaction was, you just do it, right? You just go say, come on guys, we're going to work on improvement right now, and that's the, that's the kind of pragmatic part of me saying, you know, we're all in this together, nobody's going to, you know, bite anybody. I don't know about your teams, but not, <laughs> you know, we jump into a room and we say, let's all figure this out and, 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 um, and figure it out together. So I think what's key there for me is, uh, I completely agree, the, the whole team atmosphere or the atmosphere or the, the mindset you have in an organization will make a huge difference as to how you approach this because if you have an environment where 
um, people are not allowed to say what they think, then you're going to struggle. But if you're able to say what you think, they're not penalized, they're encouraged to to bring up issues and, and bad parts of the project uh, or processes, um, then I think you get a lot of progress that way. Otherwise, you're going to be stifled if you have an environment that is not open like that. Um uh, Okay, next, uh, another technique uh, that, that you've used, Alan, before? Um, a technique that I've seen, I uh, was introduced to through the Kanban community, and it's also part of Lean and so on, is um, this is a very specific process, very process specific type of improvement, is a, a thing called value stream mapping, um, where you map out uh, the thing that comes into whatever your organization, whatever system you're going to boundaries you're choosing like comes into your team or comes into your department uh, when something comes into your department and then exits as something valuable on the other end what is the steps and the stream of value that gets added in that um, more often than not when you map that out and start tracking how much time uh, an item takes in each of those steps you'll find that there's all these places where there's long delays and other sorts of things will pop out at you and then you can that becomes pretty low-hanging fruit as a way to, you know, get a lot of performance improvement out of your system and out of your department. Because you can say, why is it that it takes two weeks for something to sit here before it goes to the next step? And then you can dive in and say, let's let's shrink that two weeks down to two days or whatever it is. Uh, those, it's a good indicator of places where you can find easy improvements and places where maybe you, they aren't easy improvements, but they're huge ones. They're huge wins if you can eliminate delays or other things that are that are causing your value stream to back up. Okay. Um, I'm going to see. sign off. Oh, thank uh, you. Apologies, and you guys continue. I've asked the community to continue to share their best practices around continuous improvement on the Twitter chat. Uh, thank you so much, Alan, and thank you, Mark, and we'll talk to you soon. Yes, thank you, Hala. Thank you, Hala. So let's get back to that value stream. Um, uh -huh. So what's the key to making that work? Um, you've got to have, as you build the value stream, uh, you need to have the people who do the work help you build it. Um, so it's also an interesting team building exercise. Helps people fully understand the flow of what comes in and how it gets turned into something valuable on the way out. Um, and you, you got to spend, uh, I don't know, an hour or two, uh, depending on how complex your process is, to just define the different states that you push an item through. Uh, let's talk about software development since that's the world that I live in most most of the time. And you know, a requirement comes in or a request for a change, and then there's analysis, and there's this, and there's that, and then there's coding, and then there's testing, and there's integration testing. You know, so there's all these steps, and so you define all those steps, and then you talk about what does it mean to be done for each of these steps. How do you know when it's ready for the next step, and then how long? You might find, for example, that coding a feature actually, if somebody were to actually sit down and just code it, it would only take four hours. But it actually is sitting around waiting for someone to code it for a week. Right. So, so now we can have a conversation as to how come it takes a week before anybody actually works on it. And what can we do? What is the cost of that delay? Is that delay really you know, hard um, to remove? And why is it hard to remove? What do we need to change to, to reduce that delay? So and, that's and, how... And probably also understanding whether that delay is um, anything that will improve or, or causes a problem in the process, right? Correct. So sometimes the delay is okay, and sometimes it's not. It's holding something else up. Right, or sometimes a delay might be completely out of your control. Uh, there was a company I worked with where they were doing... Um, they did a lot of work for... Uh, clients in the pharmacy world and so there were certain places in the process that the content had to be reviewed by lawyers and and doctors and whatever else and that was an outside firm or even the federal government doing that and it was just a black box that they had to dump stuff into and it would come back when it came back right so th there's difficult places in your in your place that maybe you can't improve or it's very hard to improve but that doesn't mean that there isn't value to be found elsewhere that you can eliminate, uh, you can reduce or eliminate suboptimal stuff and improve your efficiency. Okay. Um, 
There was a comment. Um, I, I'm not sure if we can put any context to this. Matthew Kidner, he is uh, listening to th- the, the, the Hangout. He's actually out in the community. He's not on, on PM Chat. Okay. He, he mentions um, two principles of Kanban is visualize your work and set work in progress limits. I've, I've been somewhat familiar with Kanban. I have seen uh-huh. it work a little bit, um, not in depth knowledge of it. Um, any thought, does that spawn any, any thoughts for you? Um, visualizing your work and, and set, uh, set work progress limits? Yeah, one, a very common way to set up a Kanban system is to do this value stream mapping that I'm talking about. And then from that map, you're able to set up your Kanban board to track your system. Um, and then setting work and process limits is very key to improvements. I, I'm glad he brought that up um, because when you set, when you force yourself to limit the amount of work you have in process, then you're forcing yourself to look at the bottlenecks, right? If, if I say to you, you can only have three things going at once and you reach the point where you're waiting on something else on three things and you're not allowed to now go get a fourth thing and work on it, then that forces us to look at what is it that's keeping you from getting any of those three things done. Um, and let's go improve that and solve that and make it so that you can get those, one of those three things done so that you can bring more work in if you need to. Um, that's one of the main purposes of work in oh, process limits. So, Alan, I'm sorry, you, you cut out there for oh, did uh, I? Yeah, for about, <laughs> and maybe I might have been just on my side. Oh, uh, well, I was brilliant, by the way. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, I, I am well, sure you were. <laughs> well, just to summarize, a work in process limit, when you, when you force yourself to stop bringing in new work when you're waiting on something, in other words, if, if my job is to, is to test things and I'm not able to get the test done because something is blocking me and I'm not allowed to go and try and start testing something else, mm-hmm. then... I'm now free or I'm now required to go look at why I'm getting blocked and go fix the reason that I'm blocked. Got it. So that's, that's one of the main purposes of work and process limits. It forces us to look at where our bottlenecks are and actually solve them. Does that tie into the idea that I know that um, I've, I've heard in the uh, Japanese um, automakers or, or in that whole process, um, the, the concept of if there is a, a a defect or a problem in the process, they'll actually stop the whole line um, from moving mm-hmm. until they fix that pro- that process or that defect, and then keep keep it moving. Yes, I- is that tie into what we were talking about? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so, it, if the coders are done coding but they're waiting on testing, then a work and process limit is is a place where we say, look, I'm not allowed to go work on more code. I better go help people test. Right, uh, I'm going to stop coding. I'm going to go help people test so that I can then be allowed to bring in more coding stuff. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, one, uh, I got they they started an interesting uh, question out on the PM chat. I want to get to it in a minute. But um, any any other specific techniques that you wanted to share that you that you can think of that that you've used in the past. Um, one that you mentioned, you shared some notes with me before we got started, and one that you mentioned that I think is very important is, in general, uh, you need to evolve your process, evolve your changes. Um, big wholesale changes or big wholesale improvements, you know, like changing everything all at once, uh, tends to be a very difficult thing and uh, can actually uh, cause more problems than it attempts to solve. I'm a big fan of evolving or emerging uh, fixes and changes over time um, until the organization is used to actually improving, and then maybe you can do something bigger later. I like yeah, that. good, good. The thing that I, I, I did find some information, or it, and um, that that it talked about four different things. Really, it was the self-reflection, which we've talked about, um, the feedback, that that uh, retrospectives we've talked about. Um, mm-hmm. what you just mentioned, don't try to bite off too much at mm-hmm. one time. It's, it's small chunks that we're going to take these small improvements and together they will eventually um, work out to be big improvements. Yes, um, yes. Th- then, the, then the other thing was is the, the whole efficiency. What we're doing is we're looking for 
us to identify, reduce, and eliminate sub-processes or un- unoptimized processes. Um, that's, that's the key with what we're looking for is we're trying to make sure that we identify those processes that are not working. You've talked a little bit about that. Yeah. And, and we want to either improve them or sometimes we can just get rid of the process. Just get rid of them, yes. Okay. Um, okay, so we have about five minutes left in the discussion that it, uh, in PM chat, it started talking, uh, they started talking about their, or the question that was asked was, uh, what stops us? From doing process improvements, what kinds of things are um, causing us to fail when we do process improvement? Some of the things that I see out here is sometimes we um, we we rush the results and we want to get uh, want it noticeable while continuous improvement needs time for, yeah. t- for the changes to happen. Um, there, sometimes we think about, Michael Greer said, um, main reason is we think there's no time, but, li- but little by little doesn't consume much time and helps um, save through overall efficiency. So, again, going back to the time concept. Right. Um, uh Let's see. We often miss the assessment piece. We, we implement and then consider it done. Uh, so that's true. Sometimes we we might um, think of a think or identify something, but we don't step through the final processes of of how do we make those improvements. If we have identify a process that is struggling or an area that we're of of ourselves or of the team that is struggling, and we don't take those steps to make those improvements. Uh, uh, other thoughts? Um, I'm I'm watching the. T- the PM chat stream go by here, and, and um, I'm enjoying some of these comments. Um, I, I, I and I agree that uh, we have to do things a bit at a time. Um, just dedicate a little bit of time for retrospectives, for example, but also understand that that we're going to take actions during our next iteration or next few weeks to actually correct things. Um, that's important, and I agree with that. Uh, there's there's a fascinating um, effect. It's human nature to fall back on our habits, right? And improvement is is implying that we're going to change the way we do things. We're going to change our habits, um, and so it takes a significant amount of actual cognitive energy, um, a, a certain amount of of uh, consciousness about our actions that if if we've decided to make an improvement and change the way we work and then we're in a stressful situation we have to actually fight against falling back to our old habits um, we have to consciously make sure that we don't fall back and that we're doing it, things the new way right we just want so. to be comfortable in our old place and not stretch ourselves and and push for that improvement that we've identified right. yeah Right, so it's so easy to, and and this is not um, a condemnation of anybody. It's you know, I am one of these people that <laughs> it's human nature. Get, when things get busy, I just do what I was taught ten years ago instead of what I learned yesterday. Right, and uh, and, and so we just have to be aware of that. Um, and hopefully, there's people that are watching for that as project managers or whatever your role is among your project. That's one of the things that I think we need to do is to be the person that watches for that slipping back to the way we used to do things um, to help us stay at this new place that once we get it, once we've used it enough, we will stay there on our own. That's interesting because just we're almost out of time, but just as a, a thought that came across my mind on this is that um, sometimes we might realize, or we might rely on a collective work it, does it help sometimes to have somebody in the organization or in the, on the team that is specifically concentrating on, or at least one of their jobs, is to specifically concentrate on the continuous improvement rather than just leaving it up to the collective? I would I would argue that 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 is the focus of a scrum master, for example. Okay. Um, the job of a scrum master is to create an awesome team, uh, and and that's why that role exists in Scrum. Not all Agile frameworks or other frameworks have such a role, but I think it's important to have somebody be 
the, that their primary role is to watch the process and watch how we're behaving in that process and look for improvements. Perfect. So you, we do need people to remind us that we this do. is an important thing for us. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you, Alan. Thank you again for the suggestion on the topic. It's been a great topic. I've, I've, I've personally have learned a lot. Um, as I said, I've been an accidental continuous improvement guy. And so I, I think in the future I need to be a little bit more deliberate on, on what I do. And um, you've been very helpful. And, and Hala, I know that you dropped off, but I appreciate your, your time as well and your comments. It was fun. Thank you. I enjoyed it. All right. Well, then uh, just a challenge to everybody, all everybody that's listening, go out and figure out how you can do implement continuous, uh, uh, continuous improvement techniques in your organization and in your projects. Uh, until next week, talk to you guys later. Have a great evening and a great weekend and all that. <laughs> talk all to right. you later. Bye. Bye, Alan. <laughs>